Let's discuss the abdominal muscles. Four muscle groups make up the abdominal wall. Now, starting with the anterior medial portion of the abdomen, we have the rectus abdominis. And then if we move slightly laterally to the sides, in the anterior lateral regions, we have three muscles. The external oblique muscles, the internal oblique muscles, and the transverse abdominis. Now, the rectus abdominis runs superficially, anterior medially. Of the three lateral muscle groups, the external obliques are the most superficial. Deep to the external oblique would be the internal oblique muscles. And then the deepest muscle is the transverse abdominis. Now, these muscles are not just contained in the anterior portion of the abdomen. They actually attach up into the lower ribs, as well as running laterally and even deep posteriorly towards the spine. The abdominal muscles and the muscles of the back, the erector spinae, have an agonist-antagonist relationship. Now what that means is that when the abdominal muscles, being the agonists, contract, they will physiologically inhibit the antagonist muscles, the erector spinae. So what happens is the muscles on the front here, the abdomen, shorten and contract, while the muscles on the back actually elongate and stretch. So we'll have uh, Mickey help us demonstrate here. So if the agonist muscles, the abdominal muscles contract, it's going to pull Mickey's trunk forward. And what happens is the muscles here on the back, the erector spinae, actually elongate and loosen. So if I palpate here, you can feel this is quite loose, while on the front there's definitely a, a, a contracture of the musculature. And so this is known as reciprocal inhibition. Let's first discuss the rectus abdominis. Now the muscle lies within the rectus sheath, and the sheath in this area is formed by the aponeurosis of the external, internal, and transverse abdominal muscles. The muscle fibers of the rectus abdominis run vertically, in this direction here, and the muscle is involved in stabilization of the pelvis as well as trunk flexion and rotation. Now just a point of interest is that the rectus abdominis muscle is what we refer to as the six pack, but in actuality it's an eight pack. But in order to be able to visualize that eight pack, you'd have to have such a low body fat percentage that it'd probably be unhealthy for you. So don't worry about that at all. Now, what makes the individual muscles appear like a six pack or eight pack are the actual tendinous junctions between muscle fibers. So now let's look at the origin, insertion, and action of the rectus abdominis. Now, the origin is in the pubic symphysis down here. And so we're going to have Mickey palpate, yeah? and also a little bit along the, uh, the crest of the, the pubic bone there. Now, the muscles run vertically, and they attach into the insertion, which would be at the xiphoid process. So we'll have Mickey palpate there. Yeah, perfect. Now, they also attach into the, the cartilage of the fifth through seventh ribs, here on the uh, slightly lateral to the midline here. So we'll have Mickey palpate that as well. Good. So the muscle would be housed in this area right here. Now the action when the pelvis is fixed would create a flexion motion. So we'll have Mickey turn slightly. Yep. So now if you flex forward, so the rectus abdominis involved in flexion. Now if the abdomen were fixed, so we'll have Mickey come back up, it would actually tilt the pelvis posteriorly. Perfect. And it's also involved in lateral flexion as well. So if you move side to side. Great. Now let's discuss the external abdominal oblique muscle. So looking at the muscle, it originates off of the ribs 5 through 12 in this area and is quite superficial. And the fibers are actually orientated from lateral to medial, running diagonally down. So often we'll refer to this muscle as the pocket muscle. And we'll have Mickey demonstrate and you'll see why that is. So if Mickey places her hands here, you can see it's just as if she's put her hands in her pockets, and this would be the orientation, the direction of the muscle fibers. So it's a great way to remember this muscle. Now, the muscle originates off of ribs 5 through 12, so that's 8 ribs, and is quite superficial. The superior fibers of the muscle actually are intertwined with the serratus anterior muscle as well, so it's very interesting from a kinetic chain perspective. The muscle comes down diagonally, and inserts along the anterior iliac spine, as well as the pubic bone here, and part of the external oblique aponeurosis actually tie in and help to form the inguinal ligament. 
Let's look at the action created or actions created by the external abdominal oblique muscle. So taking the fiber orientation into account, how it runs diagonally, laterally to medially, if this right external abdominal oblique were to contract, it's going to pull Mickey to that right side, but because of the fiber orientation, it's going to flex her forward and rotate as well, bringing the opposite shoulder back. Now what's important to realize is when the right external abdominal oblique contracts, it works synergistically with the left internal abdominal oblique. So these muscles work together to create trunk rotation and flexion. Now let's look at the internal abdominal oblique muscles. Now these muscles run from medial to lateral, so they would run diagonally outwards. And if we compare that to the external abdominal obliques which we just covered, which run from lateral to medial, you'll see that these muscles actually cross each other at a right angle, perpendicular angle. So we're going to have Mickey demonstrate. So this would be the fiber orientation of the internal abdominal obliques. And if we put the pocket muscles, the external abdominal obliques across that, you can see how they intersect at a right angle. Now, the internal abdominal obliques, as you can see in this simple demonstration, are deep to the external abdominal obliques, and they're sandwiched in between the external abdominal obliques and the transverse abdominals. Now, the internal abdominal oblique muscles originate off a few points here. They originate off of the inguinal ligament, as well as the iliac crest, and if we have Mickey turn slightly, also along the lumbodorsal fascia. Now, taking fiber orientation into account, they run from this area upwards and medially, inserting onto the lower three ribs, ribs 10 through 12, as well as the abdominal aponeurosis of the linea alba. Let's look at the actions of the internal abdominal oblique muscles. Now, taking fiber orientation into account, the fibers are running this way. If we have contraction on one side, and for this example we'll say the right side, it's going to pull you into the same side lateral flexion, as well as rotation to that same side. So this would be a unilateral contraction of the right internal abdominal oblique muscles. And I'll have Mickey come back. Now, if the pelvis is fixed, the internal abdominal obliques will act on the ribs, but if the ribs are fixed, the internal abdominal obliques will act on the pelvis. So we'll have Mickey demonstrate. If we fix the pelvis here, it'll pull you forward into flexion. Great. And now back. Now if the ribs are fixed, it'll actually tilt the pelvis posterior. Great. Now let's look at bilateral contraction. So if both sides, internal abdominal oblique muscles right and left contract, what happens is if the pelvis is fixed, it's going to pull you into flexion which we just demonstrated earlier. But now, if the pelvis and vertebrae are fixed, what happens is it's going to pull the lower ribs, 10 through 12, where it attaches, down and posterior, which creates compression of the abdominal uh, cavity and actually aids in expiration. And that's how the muscles, the internal abdominal oblique muscles are involved in, this, in expiration. Let's discuss the transverse abdominis muscle. Now this is the deepest of the four abdominal muscles and it inferior inferiorly into the inguinal ligament as well as that uh, iliac crest. Posteriorly it attaches into the uh, five lumbar vertebrae and then if we go superior it attaches to the inner surface of the last seven ribs as well as that it interdigitates with the fibers of the diaphragm and then anteriorly, it attaches into the linea alba. Now, this muscle is known as the corset muscle because of where it is located here in the abdomen. And as a corset, it helps to pull things in when contracted. Similar to a corset, which, you know, was quite an uncomfortable device that would literally squeeze your internal organs and, you know, didn't do really anything for women back in the 18th century. Now let's look at the actions of the transverse abdominal muscle. So, basically the muscle works to compress the abdominal pelvic cavity. It helps to stabilize the pelvis, the lumbar spinal joints, as well as the ribcage. So we'll have Mickey demonstrate here. 
if you were to pull your stomach in, there you go. So this is compression of the abdominal pelvic cavity and she's activating the transverse abdominals to do this. Now, if the lumbar spine is fixed, this muscle will pull in the abdominal cavity. But if the aponeurosis were to be fixed, it would actually increase lumbar lordosis. So that'd be an arching back. Now, an easy way to find this muscle on yourself is to take your hands and place them on the side, palpate a little bit deeply there, and basically cough. <coughs> Can you feel that? Yep. Yeah. So that's the transverse abdominus. Now let's discuss how the diaphragm and the abdominal muscles are involved in breathing. If we look at inspiration, as you take a breath in, the diaphragm contracts and the dome of the diaphragm pulls down, creating a negative pressure and more space here in the thorax and in the lungs. That allows air to flow in. Now, as we breathe out during expiration, the diaphragm will raise up and relax while all the abdominal muscles contract and squeeze the internal organs and force air out. Now an interesting note is during forced expiration when we try to breathe out as much as we can, there will always be some air left in the lungs known as a residual volume. So let's go over some palpation of the abdominal muscles. Let's start out with the rectus abdominis. So, First of all, we're just going to actually get the patient to lie on the table, put something underneath your knees, bring the knees up a little bit, arms behind the head. Mickey, why don't you just come up here a little bit, just I might do a, almost like a sit up here. Okay, back down again. Take the pads of your fingers because you have more tactile stimulation here and go towards the center right here. Okay, bring it up, you just hold that position and just kind of work your way back and forth across here. And of course, the rectus abdominis goes from the xiphoid process right down to the pubic bone. And as you go perpendicular to the fibers, and kind of work in there, you're going to feel the contraction. You feel that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, come back down again. Now, if we're going to go on to the next muscle, which is the external oblique, we're actually going to come up into flexion, and then if I'm doing this side over here, we're actually going to get Mickey to go to the other side and bring it into it. Good. And because these are the pocket muscles, and as Evangelist was explaining earlier, the fiber orientation is down like this, we're going to get in there and can Actually, get in there and palpate a little bit. You definitely feel those. Come back down again. And just come back up. Good. You feel that quite a bit? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, as we go back down again, as we were saying before, in terms of the fiber orientation, if we want to go with the internal, we're going to take and look at the fibers and say this is going to be inside, and the external is going to sit on top. So the pocket muscle underneath, and the fiber is going to wrap around this way. So what I want you to do is actually come into flexion and then go towards the same side. Right, and that just pops right up underneath my hand there. Now, come back down again. The last fibers we have to look at are the transverse abdominis. Now, basically what you want to do on this is have the person breathe out really hard. Yeah, feel the contraction there. Push out even harder a little bit. Good, and that just contracts right underneath the fingers there. And I think as Evangelist was explaining earlier, you could actually take your hands around the outside on yourself and then cough or blow up really hard. Oh yeah, I can really feel that contracting there. Good, excellent. So, just one more thing I want to talk about are some of the kinetic chain relationships with the abdominal muscles. We think of these things not working in conjunction with other structures, but it's really important to look and see how these things actually interdigitate or intertwine with other structures throughout the body. So, we were talking about earlier how, let's say for example, if we have the fibers from the external abdominal obliques and the internals, their fibers are going to cross here and they're involved in rotation. Well, they wrap around the top here and go into the serratus muscle on the side. Just sit up for a second, Ricky. And just turn this way back here. Okay, so if we look at, as it comes around from the back here, the serratus will go underneath here and it'll actually go in the muscles in the center here, the rhomboids. So we could have a problem up here, but it'll actually affect numerous things right around the side of the ribs Come back down again. It'll go right across the body from the external to the internal obliques. And just lay on your side and face over this way a little bit here. And then the connections from the internal obliques will go into the tensor fascia lata and the iliotibial tract, going down the side of the body. And then the connections from there will actually go into a muscle on the front of the shins here called the tibialis anterior. So sometimes we'll have an area where we have a lot of tension and it'll affect the body all the way across in a spiral manner. 
And a lot of times people miss problems in areas because they don't understand these kinetic chain relationships, but they're really, really important.